Good afternoon. Um, this is always, allogenic stem cell transplantation is not a very easy issue, especially in a complicated disease like myelofibrosis. Nevertheless, and today it's the only curative option, or better to say the only treatment that is able to modify the natural course of the disease, and we have seen that in many patients the natural course of the disease is transformation into secondary AML with a very dismal prognosis is actually allogenic stem cell transplantation. In the largest cohort of patients published to date is a paper published two years ago from the Seattle group, which contained 170 patients with myelofibrosis who were transplanted over, it is a retrospective analysis, over 20 years. Nevertheless, on the bottom line, we could say that allogenic stem cell transplantation could offer long-term cure, long-term survival, in about 50% of patients who it receive this treatment. Nevertheless, on the other side, we have a treatment-related mortality of more than 30%. And this makes the issue of allocating patients to allogenic stem cell transplantation so complicated. So when we consider transplantation, we have, or we consider, simultaneously the patient and patient-related factors, we ask ourselves what is the right time to perform a transplantation in a patient who has not yet transformed to AML, and then we have so many issues regarding the transplant procedure itself which need to be considered in the individual uh, decision. To patients, as you know, MF is mainly a disease of elderly with a median age at diagnosis in the seven decades, 65 to 67 years. So certainly, transplantation is not for every patient, but you know, with reduced intensity conditioning regimens, the option is now also being offered to elderly patients. But on the bottom line, I think maybe 65 years is so the upper limit, which could be accepted as a potential patient for transplantation. What is the influence of age on outcome after allogenic stem cell transplantation? Data are quite limited, and there is one work from Nicholas Krieger from Hamburg where he considered age, and he took the cutoff of 57 years because this was the median of the transplanted cohort, and he found that age above 57 is considered to be a risk factor for survival after allogenic stem cell transplantation. And this is not surprising. The older the patient, the more likely that the patient might not survive the procedure. Second issue, which is very relevant, are what are the other comorbidities in patients, as the majority are elderly. So we do have to expect many, many comorbidities, and we know very well in different hematological or even non-hematological diseases, the outcome is very much dependent on the comorbidities available, but again, data are very, very limited, and the only data I could find were the data from the Seattle paper where they showed that unexpected, which is quite expected, that patients with a low heart CT comorbidity index are the patients who are going to have the best outcome in terms of reduced non-relapse mortality. I think these things are rather simple, but then comes the issue, which patient with MF should I select regarding MF-related symptomatology, as we know very well that the performance of the patient at the time of transplantation is a very important issue which will affect the outcome and survival. And again, the Nikolaus Krieger paper, you can see that they considered constitutional symptoms as a very important risk factor for outcome after allogenic stem cell transplantation because of reduced non-relapse mortality in patients with less constitutional symptoms compared to patients with uh, important and relevant constitutional symptoms. And now the issue of splenomegaly. What is the size of spleen at the time of transplant and where are the best results? Again, we only have small data, only retrospective data. So going through all the data available, there is a consensus that the larger the spleen, the more likely that we are going to be faced with serious post-transplant morbidity as well as mortality. And it is agreed that a spleen size 
greater than 22 centimeters is actually associated with an increased treatment-related mortality. A major issue in these patients is, as you all know, who is transplanting patients with MF, it is the delayed graft function. So the question is, okay, maybe splenectomizing patients might improve outcome after allogenic stem cell transplantation. And here again, we have complete disparate and different uh, data. The data from the Seattle group showed that patients who were splenectomized had a better survival. On the other side, we have the Nicholas Krieger data, which show that patients who were splenectomized were the patients with the inferior survival. And again, there are no randomized data. So there is only one consensus that if the spleen is not that big, we could have a better graft in graftment and maybe less post-transplant morbidity. But again, the issue of spleen pre-transplant is an open issue. And now if you look at the timing, what is the right timing? Definitely prior to transformation. And as has previously already mentioned, there are so many scores, but I think most of the publications and most of the data are going in the direction of using the DIPS to assess outcome for allogenic stem cell transplantation. And again, no surprise that patients with low risk and intermediate one are the ones that are going to have the best outcome after transplantation, and the ones who actually need the transplant procedure are the ones who are most likely not to survive the transplant. And as already has been shown, again, no randomized data, but I think that the work done by Nicholas Krieger, which was presented at last ASH and what has been recently published as a letter in blood, is a very nice work because they try to compare what is better, transplantation or conventional treatment options in patients who are eligible for stem cell transplantation. So they use the Passamonte register, which is the DIPS register, excluded all patients above the age of 65, and included only the patients up to the age of 65, and compared the survival of these patients to the survival and outcome of patients transplanted in different transplant centers. It is retrospective, it is not prospective, but nevertheless, it is a very nice work because it includes a large number of patients. And what we could see very clearly from these data that patients with an intermediate two and high risk DIPS are those that are likely to benefit from allogenic stem cell transplantation. And I think this makes things much easier for us seeing patients with an IPSS of two, which is considered an intermediate two risk patient where we would rather now, based on these data, rather wait or go to conventional therapies. And the second very important issue is not to forget that all the conventional treatment arms do not contain the new treatment options, especially the JAK2 inhibitors, so we don't know what the influence of these new treatment options on outcome versus allogenic stem cell transplantation is. And what makes things not much easier is what about the new prognostic systems we have and do they change the decision to perform allogenic stem cell transplantation as previously mentioned, the ASXL1 mutation. But as you have very nicely shown, maybe was written in large letters, maybe, we still simply don't know. But this might be an additional tool we might use, especially in younger patients, the assessment of molecular and mutational status in patients to decide whether to treat the patients. The issue of cytogenetics is another issue. And you know, the classifications of high risk and good risk cytogenetics similar to AML is not that clear cut like in AML in patients with NMF. I think this is a matter of big debate, and again, we lack data to show that patients with high-risk cytogenetics could really benefit more from transplant versus non-transplant modalities. So we have much, much more open questions than answers. And again, very shortly to the transplant procedure itself, again, there are a lot of issues. You know, conditioning is a big issue with so many conditioning regimens, including the reduced intensity conditioning, but on the bottom line, we could say that there is no one conditioning regimen which is better or superior than the others. 
Well, to use a related or unrelated donor, a well-matched unrelated donor nowadays gives similar results to a sibling donor, so at least this is a fact we have. We should avoid <coughs> sorry, using unrelated, uh, sorry, mismatched transplants because the outcome is definitely inferior, especially in patients with MF. And again, regarding peripheral blood stem cells or bone marrow, there is no difference. So these are simple issues. <coughs> Now, what about the JEC2 inhibitors and the treatment of patients prior to transplantation with a JEC2 inhibitor? What is the risk? Is there a benefit? And what is the evidence? Very shortly, the benefit, I think, is very clear to everybody. We reduce the spleen size, which is a matter of debate, prior to transplantation and outcome. We might <coughs> improve the constitutional symptom of a patient and thereby improve his performance status again. This might improve outcome. And we know through the JAK1 inhibition, we reduce cytokines, and this might be also good for the outcome after allogenic stem cell transplantation, especially for graft versus host disease. So these are the issues we have. And I will show you very shortly what is the evidence, because we do not have that much evidence. What are the risks that might be associated with the use of a roxolitinib prior or a JEC2 inhibitor generally prior to transplantation. First of all, the so-called rebound phenomenon, an abrupt discontinuation, and then comes conditioning with the cytokine storms it causes. This might cause severe rebound phenomena, and I will show you the results available. The second theoretical risk is we are doing a kind of immunomodulation. We might be delaying T-specific responses, so we might increase viral infections, and we know that we do have evidence of increased herpes infections, for example, in patients treated with roxolitinib, and in the transplant setting, this might be even a bigger issue. And not to forget the potential drug-drug interactions, especially the use of cyclosporine, for example, mainly metab metabolized by the cytochrome, enzymes, which is again the same site where ruxolitinib is metabolized. So there are potential risks, and there are still very, very big issues. Should we, how long should we treat prior to transplantation? In our cohort, we had a median of six months. In the cohort of Nikolaus Krueger, it was two months, so nobody really knows. Should we transplant responders to ruxolitinib only? or should we only transplant the non-responders to ruxolitinib? And there is initial evidence. This is in our group, as well as in the group of uh, Nicolas Grieger, which suggests that response to ruxolitinib might be a predictor to a good response after allogenic stem cell transplantation. And the issue of anemia, as we know very well that the Seattle group have very clearly shown that anemia, MF-related anemia, anemia is clearly associated with an inferior survival. And we know that anemia is one of the risk factors in the IPSS and in the DIPS. So we are giving the patients a drug, ruxolitinib, which could cause anemia, especially initially. And although we know that the anemia of ruxolitinib does not have an impact on survival without allogenic stem cell transplantation. We don't know whether this is also true in the case of transplantation. So, as I said, many, many issues that are still open. And what is the evidence? As I said, we have only very few publications with a limited number of patients. And on the bottom line, we could say definitely that ruxolitinib prior to allogenic stem cell transplantation reduces the spleens. It is feasible. It doesn't seem to increase the treatment-related mortality. GVHD does not seem to increase, and actually there is evidence of that we could use ruxolitinib as an effective treatment for treating graft versus host disease in the post-transplant setting. And with rebound, the question tapering, non-tapering, we usually taper. We have only 14 patients published here, and we don't know whether this is the right way. Nicholas Krieger, again, they tapered, and in other publications, which are just as abstracts, there are also some tapering, some none. So we do not still have clear evidence, but as I said, from the small group of patients we have here, it seems that responders to ruxolitinib seem to do very well in the post-transplant setting, but again, we need much more data 
So I come to the final slide, and I'm really sorry because I gave you much more questions than answers, but these are the data available. Not to forget, allogenic stem cell transplantation remains today the only curative option, especially for younger patients, especially DIPS, intermediate two and high-risk patients have a better survival if transplanted compared to conventional uh, therapies, excluding the new JAK inhibitors. There are no data yet available. And as I said, it is a very complicated issue allocating patients where we have to consider all the different aspects associated with this. And as I said, with the introduction of ruxolitinib and other JAK2 inhibitors in the pre-transplant setting, but also in the post-transplant setting, it might be helpful, but still there are many, many open questions and I think we need much more data and some clinical trials to try to answer some of these questions that are underway. Thank you very much.